over to you, Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Zev Farber. Thank you for joining us. All right, and, and thank you for having me in uh, Z Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, first, let me just give an overview of what I'm going to try to do uh, before we look at the texts, because one of the problems with doing a topic like this is we're going to be looking at some unpleasant texts, and then we're going to be looking at some unsatisfying answers. Uh, so I want to give you sort of an arc uh, of where this is going to go, so you can at least uh, hope to wait to the end and see if anything more satisfying comes later. Um, I want, uh, as Shmuley said, you know, once you leave a certain fundamentalist uh, discourse which says, by very definition, anything that's written in the holy books must be good, and therefore if I read it, I just have to change my own moral thinking uh, and not challenge the text at all, really just challenge myself. Once you leave that as you're given, uh, you have to confront the fact that there are many things in the Torah and in the Talmud uh, that we find to be, that most modern people would find to be ethically problematic. And the question is, how do we think about it? Uh, now, at the end, I'm going to share a little bit what I call the wave theory or how, I, how I've thought about it uh, and how I continue to try to think about it. But what I want to show first is a middle stage, uh, which is it doesn't go from the Torah, a work from, you know, over 3,000 years ago to modern times and nobody noticed anything before because moral thinking is very, uh, changes over time. Moral thinking is very time period uh, determined. So already, even though the Talmud itself contains many things that would be problematic to us ethically, the Torah contained a number of things that was problematic to Chazal, to the rabbis, ethically. And they already had to think about this problem. Uh, so before I introduce how I suggest we can maybe think about the problem nowadays, I wanted, I wanted to take a few examples, A, to show things in the Torah that would be morally problematic to most of us, and show how Chazal tried to deal with it. And from that, say what doesn't work for us and how Chazal tried to deal with it uh, and then think about how maybe we could deal with it because again we don't live at the same period as Chazal and our own way of thinking has to has to adjust accordingly. I'll add one more thing which is as internet is not a perfect technology if I bug out for a little bit of time if Shmuley or somebody can tell me that I did so I could <laughs> go back and hit what I missed because uh, that sometimes happens. I don't want to leave everybody behind while I'm talking to myself. Um, now, what I did here was, in the, in the source sheets that I sent you, I included three laws and the responses by the rabbis. And we'll talk about what is problematic in these laws, what was bothering the rabbis, how the rabbis wanted to handle it, I will not jump into each case at the beginning to say how I think we can handle it. I want to go back after we've looked at all three and talk about what might be a more modern approach you know, that might be ethically satisfying to us uh, on how to deal with it. But I want you to get a sense of the kind of problems I'm talking about and the kind of solutions the rabbis offered uh, so we can reflect a little bit about why they may not be the solutions for us. Because there's another form of fundamentalism, which you might call rabbinic fundamentalism, which is to say this. Sure, the Torah has lots of problematic things, but that's because we don't understand the Torah. But Chazal understood the Torah. So when they changed something from the Torah, that means the Torah didn't really mean it. The rabbi explained to you what it really meant. But then there we have to stop again. That must be ethics, right? That's the end, ethics. So whatever was solved by then was solved, and whatever wasn't, that's it. We're stuck with it. You know, Talmudic fundamentalism, right? There's biblical and there's Talmudic. And you'll find both uh, in, in modern Judaism, depending on the flavor of uh, which person you're talking to. Uh, and I really don't, I'm really dissatisfied with both, but I want to show you how, you know, how they work. Okay. So the first case, for those of you, you can look up the source sheet. Um, Page one, I have the biblical law, right, uh, called case one, marrying a daughter to a rapist. I will just mention before we read this, um, while this is not a particularly uh, practical problem to most modern Jews, this practice exists in the world still. Right? This is not uh, a relic of history. There are many cultures where this is still uh, the solution with all the problems that come with it. So, uh, 
you know, it, it's one of these cases where to us it feels like history, but in the world it's, it's, uh, it's still present, if, if not uh, present for, for us. So the biblical law is like this. It, it's, it's part of a, uh, a set of laws. This is actually two laws. One is, the first one I'm quoting is seduction. I want to show you that for comparison. You'll see why when we get to page two. Um, and the second one is rape. One appears in the book of Exodus, and the, the seduction law appears in the book of Exodus, and the rape law appears uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so first, we'll look at the, the Exodus law. Um, I will read it and, uh, with the translation. Um, if a man seduces a virgin, when they say virgin, their main point is, is less about, you know, when we ask if someone lost their virginity, they're, they're talking about a social context of a young girl who's not engaged, never been married, and still lives with her in her father's house, right? That's what they mean. Um, we're also most likely speaking about someone rather young. Right, meaning if I had to throw out a number, we're talking about a tween. It doesn't have to be, but uh, if I had to guess what they're imagining, they're imagining someone in the in the realm of uh, eleven to fourteen. Right, that's that's I think what they're thinking. Um, so, if a man seduces a virgin for whom the bride price has not been paid uh, and lies with her, he must make her his wife by payment of a bride price. If her father refuses to give her to him, he must still weigh out silver in accordance with the bride price for virgins. So when we see this law, let's first unpack it. Again, I'm not gonna jump into any of their later rabbinic interpretations and all that, right? I just wanna to try to understand what this law is saying. Uh, the main concern of this law is that uh, when a young girl gets married, the father gets a certain amount of money, right? Um, that's the social norm. But uh, the money is much less, if at all, if it turns out that the girl is not a virgin or has been married before or anything like that. So by seducing this young girl, he has cost uh, the father a lot of money. That's the main problem. Right, that he is, he's not going to be able to collect a mohar, right, the bride price, uh, if he eventually succeeds in marrying her. There's also a secondary problem. And I'm not saying it's secondary ethically. I'm saying it's secondary in the way the law is presented, uh, which is she's going to have trouble getting married. And her choices are going to be much more limited. So they also solve that problem. The Torah also solves that problem by saying that he has to marry her. However, the father can refuse it. It never mentions whether she can refuse it. Sociologically speaking, 3,500 years ago, uh, marriage was, was, was much more uh, a way of keeping people alive, meaning that uh, the, the, it was an agrarian economy. The farmers had the money. These were large extended families. Uh, and it's not like she would go out and get a job without marriage. There's a serious question of what happens when her father dies. How will she support herself? Uh, so the, the ability for her to get married uh, was very important. So the idea for us of marriage and love and, and, someone, and all that, it was not really something they thought about, certainly not in the text, whether the girl herself thought about it. We don't know because she doesn't really have a voice in this one. The next law is to us perhaps even more shocking. In this previous one, we're talking about seduction. Of course, seduction by, most likely from an adult man and a very young you know, teenager girl. Uh, the next one, though, is about force, right? It's in Deuteronomy. If a man comes upon a girl, a virgin who is not engaged, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are discovered. The man who lay with her shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he has violated her, he can never have the right to divorce her. Now here, we have a lot of similar elements that I will highlight a shift in the discourse. Right? The elements of the two major concerns are still here. Number one, the father's money is still mentioned, right? And again, 
he has to pay. Number two, the girl's future is still mentioned. Um, and that is that he has, to, he has to marry her. And it adds an important caveat, which is by the fact that he took her by force, he loses the right of divorce. Right? In the Torah, there is uh, a right of divorce. It's always described as the right of the man, uh, which is a different ethical problem, but not one I want to deal with today. Um, here he loses it because, because, he, because he took her by force. Now, for us, obviously, the idea that a solution to the problem of the rape of a young girl uh, would be that she marries her rapist is horrifying. But first, I want to give you guys a little context of what things sounded like back then. So in this one example, I want to grab something from the Middle Assyrian laws. Okay, the Middle... Assyria, for those who don't know, Assyria was one of the first major world empires. It had multiple times when it was very powerful. It's really the Neo-Assyrians, the later Assyrian empire that uh, is the one that we know of from the Bible, right? Tiglat Pileser III, who conquers, uh, who, who conquers the, the, the Transjordan, and then eventually Shalmaneser V, the Sargon II, who destroy Israel. Um, so they're famous for that, but but they were around for hundreds of years. They were very important. I think they're modern day Kurdistan. The Kurds are probably descendants of the Assyrians. Um, and in a period well before the Torah, right, they had a set of laws, which we call the Middle Assyrian laws. They, they exist in, in cuneiform, right? And they have parallel laws, or you can say that we have parallel laws and their laws. And, and it's not that, the, it's not that the, the, Israel, you know, the Israelite scribes copied from Middle Assyrian laws. They wouldn't have access to it. I'm trying to give you a flavor for what ancient Near Eastern laws sounded like. There's probably, there were probably many, many different variations on this type of thing. And obviously, this is a problem uh, that is existent in all societies and has to be dealt with. But here is this. Middle Assyrian laws, 55. If a man forcibly seizes and rapes a maiden who is residing in her father's house, right? So same, same case. The father of the maiden shall take the wife of the fornicator of the maiden and hand her over to be raped. We do not have a parallel to that. I'm just giving you a sense of how things worked back then. Uh, he shall not return her to her husband, but he shall take her and keep her. The father shall give his daughter who is the victim of the fornication into the protection of the household of her fornicator or rapist, as we would say. Um, the, they don't have a, there's not a word for rape necessarily in Akkadian or, or even in Hebrew, really. In Hebrew, just to say that there's no actual word for rape in the Torah. You can tell it's rape when it adds an, another verb, they grabbed or tafas, right? A, a, word, a word that implies force, right? But there's no one word, like in English, for rape, right? You have, to, you have to pick it up from the context. Um, if he, the, the rapist, has no wife, right? Then this rapist shall give triple the silver as the value of the maiden to her father. A rapist shall marry her. He shall not reject her. If the father does not desire it, he shall receive triple, triple silver for the maiden and he shall give his daughter to whoever he chooses. So, you see a lot of elements. First of all, one element that's clear, and this, by the way, is, is something that uh, if you want some of the things that, if, you, if we wanted to go to a lecture on biblical ethics in comparison with, uh, with, with its time period, um, one thing that the Bible is not into is, is called vicarious punishment, which is that I punish you by punishing a loved one of yours, your children, your spouse, your parents, right? That was a common practice back then. It's one thing that actually the Torah is pretty consistently against, right? It's not a, so, uh, so you, we don't see this element of, uh, of, of the, the, the hurting of the man's wife or his daughter or something like that, like you see here. And there are other examples of this um, in, in, in Hammurabi and other ancient Eastern laws. However, we do see some similarities. Number one, uh, not only does the Middle Assyrian laws require payment of the bride price, um, but he requires extra. So either father gets the man's wife plus the bride price, or he gets triple the bride price. He gets extra payment 
for the fact that he didn't get paid with the wife. Uh, we also see the solution for the daughter is more or less the same, which is they get married. He can't say no. He is, he, he's, lost, he's lost the option of refusal. It doesn't mention divorce, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if part of this means that there can't be a divorce. Um, and again, we hear about the, the father, like we saw with seduction, we didn't see it with the rape, but we saw it with seduction, that the father has a right of refusal if he decides that he doesn't want his daughter to marry this guy, and he, he doesn't have a problem dealing with uh, you know, supporting her and finding her someone else to marry. Uh, the father has that right. Whether the girl has any right of refusal, again, there's no mention of it. So first, I just want to point out that when we're reading the Torah's law, we have to first remember, we have to read it in the context of ancient Near Eastern practices, right? What the concerns were, what the norms were. To read it in the context of modern practices uh, is to hold it in a light that it, that it itself would not understand, right? How we, how we do that, we'll talk about. Uh, shortly, but at first it's it's worth noting that. Now, the rabbis are not us, and the rabbis do not have the exact same uh, ethical sense that we have. However, they did have a problem apparently with one aspect of this law, which is that there's no mention that the daughter can refuse the man. Now, just to give a little sense of the sociological switch that occurred between biblical times and rabbinic times, which might help a little bit understand why this, of all things, bothered them. Um, in biblical times, like I mentioned, you have essentially extended family organization. What I mean is that the, the nuclear family that we're used to, that the main family is, you know, the, the couple, and then they have their children and all that, um, that's not necessarily how, how the rabbis always thought of it, how the, how the Torah always thought of it. There's a lot of this idea that you join a family group. You see it also in the Middle Assyrian laws that that person's family. And the relationships of that family are, are very strong. So, for example, the whole law of Yibum, which the Torah loves and the rabbis hate, works with that concept. Um, um, uh, yibum is lever at marriage, right? A brother dies, the other brother marries her. Right, to us, that's well, just because she likes one man. What does that mean she's going to like his brother? Right? That, to us, that's ridiculous. Right? That, why, why would you assume that? I mean, it's not impossible, but it's very likely, more likely than not that she won't particularly like his brother. Um, but that's, but to, to the Torah, it's, all about, it's, it's very much about the family. To the rabbis already, again, they, the, in rabbinic culture, um, it's already much more nuclear family units. And the relationship between the, uh, the, the husband and the wife was much more central and the extended family less. So who you marry is a, is a much bigger deal. Um, and one of the things that plays out it is how the rabbis, for, for leverage marriage, they, they try to make it uh, go away. They build up uh, the ways of getting out of it. And for here, you will see, we're not going to read the whole text, uh, it's, it's a complicated text. It's on page three of your handout. Um, but the bottom line is this whole long text is an attempt to prove that the, that the girl always has the right of refusal. Right? They try to prove it from the texts. The proofs are not particularly uh, convincing. Um, you know, they say, for example, one of the lines, it says, uh, she will be his wife, right? The lo tiele isha, mi da'ata, from her, with her consent. They're saying that the implication is with her consent. That's kind of not a very good proof because it doesn't say that. But to them, it's obvious that if, if she's going to be his wife, it must be with her consent. Um, and all these authorities, Abaye, Rava, they're all trying to prove that. Okay? They also try to prove the father always has an override. But the more important thing is they're the first text to bring in the question of the woman's consent, which is helpful partially. I mean, from our perspective, it's helpful because it gives her a way out of it. However, what the rabbis do not do, and we'll talk about this after we look at the other two examples, they do not overhaul the law. Right? They, do not, they do not say, wait a second. Why? Why would we want her to marry 
her rapist. That's kind of a terrible ending to this. He's an he's an unethical person. He hurt her. It's traumatic, right? They don't bring up any of that. Um, they don't bring up a criticism of the law. What they do is they come up with a way out of the law, right? So the rabbinic solution here, and I want to show it in two more examples. The rabbinic solution is to deal with the moral problem by neutralizing its practical effects, right? Practically speaking, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. So practically speaking, from their perspective, they solved that problem, right? But it, it still leaves a lot conceptually uh, to be desired, and, and those of us uh, in modern times would likely feel that it's insufficient. I want to show the rabbis doing this in two other cases, and then go back to what might be another type of solution. So, here's another law, from, also from Deuteronomy, on page four of your handout. Proscribing, proscribing is apparently the uh, JPS translation of wholesale slaughtering. Um, right? <coughs> the basic law goes like this. Chapter 20 in Deuteronomy is about war. The laws of war are already quite unpleasant from our perspective, which is the basic law of war, not this one yet. We'll talk about this one in a second. The basic law of war goes like this. If you go to war against another country, it doesn't say why. Uh, it could be for many reasons, right? You want to conquer them. They got you upset. Whatever, whatever the Cassus belly is. You go up to their city. Right, they're, they're, they're talking about conquering cities, right? Back then, you remember they have, uh, they have basically cities that are self-contained units, right? They're surrounded by a wall. Uh, that's how it works. You go to the city and you say, we want peace. What you mean, just put it in, 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 in more uh, straightforward language, surrender, right? Go to the city, you say surrender. If they surrender, then they agree to be a vassal city, which means they pay. Uh, a, a, a percentage of taxes or corvée labor or whatever it is that you want from them uh, per year. And that's it. And you leave them be. If they say, no, we don't want to surrender, then, according to this chapter, you can take the city, kill all the men, and divide up the women and children as slaves. Now, it's quite horrible, but if anyone reads Roman history or any history back then, that is what happens, right? So uh, I'm in the middle of a biography of Julius Caesar, and anyone who crosses Julius Caesar, that's what he does, right? He conquers them, kills the men. Uh, he doesn't kill all the men. All the men is probably an exaggeration. He sells whoever's left as slaves. Right? That's, that's what slavery was back then, right? It means in general, it means you got lost. That's why there's a whole rabbinic rule uh, of pidyon shvuim, right? Buying back the people who were taken in these attacks, right? Because why are they there? They were conquered, or sometimes they were taken by pirates. Julius Caesar himself, by the way, was conquered, was taken by a pirate and redeemed, right? Um, so, but I don't want to talk about that law. It's an unpleasant law, and it's, it's, it's quite ethically problematic. However, it's, it's very normal for back then. That doesn't defend it, but it gives you a little context. What I want to talk about is the next law. All of that is only if you're conquering people who are outside your own country. However, in a law, a mythic law, because it's aimed at the desert, it's a desert generation who ostensibly were going to conquer the land, um, it says, uh, Deuteronomy 2016, but in the towns of the, of the latter people, meaning the people who, the, the nations that live here now, the Canaanites it's referring to, right? The seven nations in the Torah, um, which your God is giving you as a heritage, you shall not let a soul remain alive. No, you must prescribe them, meaning slaughter them, man, woman, and child. The Hittites, and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Prezites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Right? So meaning, to put it very simply, we must, when we enter the land, ethnically cleanse it of all the inhabitants that were there before us. Right? That's the law. Now, because this is actually the thing that I, I wrote my dissertation on about uh, Joshua, I will just make one point, which is um, Deuteronomy uh, and, and these laws were written uh, way, after, uh, way after this period of time. 
in a period of time where they were under the thumb of the Assyrians and eventually under the thumb of the Babylonians and destroyed. So th what we're seeing here is to some extent uh, what you call a, uh, a fantasy narrative. If only we had done this, we would have been righteous and we would not have sinned and there God now would have been angry at us. Right? So they paint the generation of having done it. Archaeologically speaking, it is very clear that that is not what happened. In fact, I'll just mention a little tidbit. So I, I for five years, participated in archaeological dig in Teliton. Teliton is a, is a, was a, let's say, in the 12th, 12th, 11th, 10th century BCE, was a Canaanite village in the Shephelah, in the lowlands of Judah. Right? In the 9th and 8th century, it is a Judean village, or becomes a Judean city. I, dug, I spent five years digging up a giant, the governor's mansion, essentially, a giant house. There is no destruction layer. So just as a historical tidbit, it's very clear. They were not killed. They just saw, you know, by the time David became king, they saw which way the wind was blowing, and they joined, right? That uh, the, the Israelites were becoming dominant in the area. It was turning into a kingdom, and, you know, and, and when in Israel, do as Israelites do when they, uh, they just joined. No killing. I'm not saying that no Canaanites were killed. Plenty were killed in earlier battles. But the idea that we came in and slaughtered all of them, like in the book of Joshua, that's a historical fantasy. Uh, and Deuteronomy legislates that fantasy. However, just because it didn't happen doesn't mean the law is not <laughs> it's ethical. Uh, and of course, for a different lecture, but worth noting, uh, there's always a problem uh, when you have texts that were written in times of weakness, which then uh, still exist in times of strength, where suddenly you're not, you're not fantasizing about uh, what you could do, but you actually could do it. And that becomes very dangerous because the text is still holy as if it happened. And if you're a fundamentalist, you believe that it did and believe that it should, it's a very dangerous thing. However, um, Again, we can see a strategy of the rabbis to make it irrelevant. I'll look at the, here I'm just showing you in, in Maimonides' codification of the law, right? So listen to how he, uh, and this he's basing this on the rabbis and invent this, how he gets out of it. It is a positive commandment to proscribe against slaughter of the seven nations, as it says, you must proscribe them. Anyone who comes upon one of them and doesn't kill him has violated a positive commandment. As it says, you shall not let a soul remain alive. So he, he counts the law, right? If you see a Canaanite on the street, you're supposed to kill him on the spot. Same with Amalekites, it's in a different law, but it's the same thing. But their memory has already been wiped away. What does that mean? So the Talmud has a, the Talmud has a funny rule to get out of all these problems. It gets them out of many, many problems called Ba Sadcher of Bilbela to Umot. That Sadcher of the king of Assyria Right? He, was, uh, not, he was not the one who destroyed Israel. He was the um, son of that one, Sargon's son. He, he conquered much of Judah, everything but Jerusalem. Uh, he also conquered many other territories. And the rabbis say when he came, he mixed everybody up, and therefore nobody knows what a Canaanite is, what a Moabite is, what an Ammonite is. Nobody knows anything. They're all gone. So the bottom line is this. If they're a Canaanite, most likely Joshua killed them. And therefore, there are no Canaanites. And if he did it, Sancher have already mixed them all up. And therefore, this law has no practical application. Again, we have, the same pro we have the same type of solution from the rabbis, which is the practical problem, how do I avoid somebody stabbing a Canaanite on the street, is avoided by saying there are no more Canaanites. But the ethical underpinning problem is not dealt with. Right? The rabbis are, were pra solved it practically. Third example. Okay. According to the Torah, right, there's the, what's called the law of the rebellious son. Okay? Deuteronomy 21. If there's a son who's rebellious, it says he's a drunkard, he's a glutton, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't respect his parents, he doesn't listen to them, you bring him out to the elders, right? His father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his town at the public place of his community. They shall say to the elders of his town, this son of ours is disloyal and defiant. He does not heed us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Thereupon the men of his town shall stone him to death. Rough. 
I mean, how many children would survive this? <laughs> uh, thus, you will sweep out evil from your midst. Now, it's not hard to see why the rabbis did not like the idea of people wholesale murdering their teenagers, right, in, in public stonings. Um, right? That's, but they didn't like it. So let me show you a couple of practical ways they get out of it. Again, without challenging the Torah directly, this is what they do. So first one, from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. Remember it says that he's a glutton and a drunkard. The rabbis grab onto this. When is the son behaved in a way to qualify him as a rebellious son? Once he eats a tartimer of meat and half a log of wine. Rabbi Yossi says a mana of meat and a log of wine. Okay, these are impossible quantities. It's like saying, how do I know he's a glutton? Because he ate a side of beef in five minutes. So say, well, nobody can eat a side of beef in five minutes. Even if he wanted to, he be, physically, you can't do it. And he, then he drank an entire keg of beer. So you say, well, obviously nobody ever does that. Right? It's not possible. Exactly. The rabbis moved the number up so high that it's physically impossible, basically, for any person to do this. And therefore, practically speaking, there will never be a son who violates this rule. If that's not enough, the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, a few hundred years later, um, adds another one. Rabbi Yehuda says, because remember it says, his father and mother say, the Amru, right in Hebrew, and they say. Rabbi Yehuda says, if the voice, appearance, and size of his mother is not the same as that of his father, he cannot be categorized as a wayward son. Why is this? Because the verse says, he does not listen to our voice. Just as their voices need to be identical, so does their appearance and their height. Okay, so we all know, I mean, it's true that as couples get older, they say that their mannerisms become more similar, but there is no husband and wife team that their voice and their height and their look are exactly the same. That's not a thing. It's physically impossible. So again, I've, I've showed you now three cases, and I think we could characterize what the rabbis are doing here, right? The rabbis are solving a practical problem, right? Without challenging the moral underpinnings, they're basically saying, um, you won't marry your daughter to a rapist because she'll just say no, right? You won't kill your children because it's, because all the, we made it impossible to ever charge them with the thing, right? Because you, your parents are not identical and nobody could drink that much wine or eat that much meat, right? And you'll never have to worry about, uh, I don't want to kill this guy just because he's a Canaanite. Because there are no Canaanites. Done. Now, there's something, and here I want to get to what I call the wave theory. There's something a little unsatisfying about this, which is what we're essentially doing is making Torah passages irrelevant. Right? We're just, mar we're, without actually excising them from the text, without cutting them out of the Torah, we have basically put an X on it. Right? What do I do about killing the Canaanites? X, don't worry about it. No Canaanites. Right? What do I do about my rebellious son? X, there's no such thing as a rebellious son. Right? What do I do about my daughter? Was, you know, rapist, forget it. Don't marry her rapist. Done. But that makes the Torah irrelevant. That's kind of, that is, so on one level, it's unsatisfying. I don't want the Torah to be irrelevant. I don't want to just X out all the things that, you know, what's left behind is the things I already agree with. That seems a little problematic. Am I really reading the Torah then? That's one level of unsatisfying. There's another level of unsatisfying, which is, I know the rabbis are bothered, but they're simply not, uh, they're simply not uh, dealing with the ethical problems. I'll respond to Judy's question a little bit because I've actually written on homosexuality. Um, they're, not they're not responding to the ethical problems explicitly. They're not saying, look, there's a real problem here. Right? They're, they're acting as if technically, technically, technically these laws don't apply. But if they did apply, they'd be perfectly fine. Right? There's, like, there's a kind of a nod, nod, wink, wink going on, right? Where they're making it disappear without editing it. Both of those things to me feel unsatisfying. So I want to take the case of uh, the, the rape as a, as a paradigm of, of maybe looking at something else. First of all, I certainly do appreciate the rabbis, at least on a technical level, have solved our practical problems. However, what do we do with this text? 
right? Do we just say this is an irrelevant text and kind of uh, a little backwards? I think what we want to do is this. Once we get rid of the fundamentalist narrative, which is a problematic narrative in so many ways, uh, and one of the problems is it doesn't really allow us to learn Torah. Because when I'm in a defensive mode and I say, no, 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 this, God said this, literally, and he wants us to do this, right? I'm stuck. So I, don't, I, I can't explain why God would want me to do such a thing. Um, so either I reject it or I force myself to accept it or I just live with the fact that the rabbis made it a, you know, at least not a practical problem. But I can't really learn it, but I want to learn it. So I want, if I put aside the fundamentalist narrative, I want to ask myself this. What are the authors of these texts trying to do? What do they want to do? And here, I think um, the answer seems relatively clear, which is, first of all, they definitely see the rape of a young girl as a wrong. They want to right the wrong. But they want to right the wrong not in, in modern society. They want to right the wrong in their society, in the society they understand. Right? Now, in their society, um, marriages are entirely different than our marriages. First of all, many women who were married back then were kidnapped. I mean, this is like a horrible thing to think about, but it was pretty standard in, in, in ancient times that a lot of wives were women who were taken at war after you killed their parents. I mean, it's horrible, but that's, that's you know, uh, Genghis Khan's mother was that. Um, it's all over. Now, also, girls were generally married off very young to people who could afford to pay the bride price. So you're talking about, you know, age disparity and also economic considerations, meaning even if the father is very loving and a nice guy, there are economic considerations um, because he needs to make sure his daughter is going to survive. And that's just what marriage was. Um, now, it's possible that very wealthy people didn't have to put up with that kind of thing. Right? So like nowadays, you know, a certain amount of wealth can get you out of many things. We saw that even in the middle of Syrian laws. The father says, I don't care. I can do what I want. So then fine. But so we're talking about two wrongs it's worried about. Wrong number one, the financial wrong to the father, which back then was a serious consideration. Um, that's not how marriage works for us, but it's how it worked for them. Number two, the wrong to the daughter, which is she's not going to be able to get married. Or at least she's not going to be able to get married easily. And the father may have to make compromises that might be even worse, right? May have to marry to a very poor man who can't support her, right? A very, very old man, a third wife of somebody. I mean, there's, there's, there's many things. So perhaps this is a better option. So if you think about it, what the Torah Shrine accomplishes is two things. Number one, right any financial wrongs, right? That, that may have occurred. In this case, it was to the father. Um, number two, write the situation for the girl so that she doesn't have to suffer the consequences of what he did to her, right? And those consequences would have been inability to, to, to marry. If that is what it is, the reason I call it something wave theory is I imagine, let's imagine there's a moral principle. Let's imagine we could somehow remove the, the, the specific social context and try to distill the moral principle that the law is trying to share with us. How would we apply that, right? If the, if the moral principle waves through time and travels through time and it hits us at our period, how do we apply it, right? What does it look like now? So for example, if we're talking about uh, righting financial wrongs and even more importantly, fixing the situation for the girl so that she doesn't suffer the consequences of the act, what do we say? Nowadays, the consequences of a rape are very different, right? They're less practical consequences in the sense of, well, now, you know, we announce her as a non-version and therefore she'll never get married, right? That's not, however, the psychological harm nowadays is very acute. Many women, and I'm, this, I'm, not, I'm not adding anything new, I have no special insight to this, need years of therapy, have trouble with relationships. Um, you know, it could affect jobs. Also, we're not talking about just 12 year old girls because we're, again, we're not talking about the practical fear that she won't be able to get married because she's not a virgin is not, that's not our social fear. 
right? Our issues are the psychological issues. Um, so in theory, what I might say is, no, of course, she's not going to marry him. That, that, that would be repugnant. And it's not even a question, I would say, for almost all women in Western society. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure you could find some special on some talk show of someone who did it. But in general, it's just not an option that, any, that, that women nowadays consider. However, um, the, the costs of years of therapy, perhaps what the Torah is saying, is in our society, that is the punishment. How long? Well, we just said he can never, you know, in the Torah it says he can't divorce her. What I learned from he can't divorce her is there's not a time limit, right? The damage that he did to her it, it could in theory be permanent, right? She could never get remarried and therefore he can never divorce her. We might say, look, I don't know. How, lo- how long therapy does she need? How long does she need? You know, she needs, she needs years and years of it. Well, that's his problem. You know, he, he has to pay. He, he has to pay as much as she needs um, that's it. That's what the that's what the law is trying to say. He's got to right the financial wrongs. The financial wrongs in this case is not to the father, right? That our side doesn't work that way, right? The financial wrongs are to her, and he has to fix it. I would say similar. We can learn similar things from other from other rules. Um, I'm not going to go with the other two that we we did here. Um, I think that. An approach like this, which allows us to go back into the ancient context of the laws and ask, what is it trying to accomplish? You know, assuming that they have a moral sense, but their moral sense is socially and historically uh, contingent on the reality that they lived in. That's why I brought the Middle Assyrian laws, so you can get a sense of what reality looked like. Um, that's how we have to, I think, approach these laws so that we maintain their relevance and maintain their morality. And while we can at one end say the laws have serious ethical problems, we can also say at the same time, they're trying to accomplish something, but our moral sense is different. And therefore, we can, it can, they can only be relevant if they accomplish something ethical in our Right within the moral framework in which we live, right? I think it, it's more straightforward. Um, I, I can open it up for questions. Someone did ask a question already. I don't know if people want me to respond to that, or you want to. How do you want to do this now? Yeah, Zev, why don't you why don't you um, respond to Judy's question, and then we'll open it up beyond that. Um, I although the the only challenge is um, that we have only about thirteen minutes left, <laughs> yes. and we want to hear some more voices. Um, yes. So actually, actually, before you answer Judy's question, why don't we hear some more questions and thoughts from folks, and then maybe you can respond to folks collectively if that works. That's fine. Okay, great. So don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to ask something now. Well, <clears throat> Zev, uh, this is David speaking. Yeah. Here's, what I, here's what I heard from you. Um, <clears throat> and tell me if you think this makes sense. Number one, the, the first thing I heard was the Torah wants to, 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 to make right a wrong. That's sort of the starting place. Number two, the Torah wants to teach or introduce a bold new lesson or a solution in order to right that wrong. Number three. Now, I'm not sure it's bold or new, but it does, is interesting a solution. It's, it's quite similar to other solutions. But. Okay, it may not, okay, it may not be bold uh, or new, but it's... Uh, but it is a... It's a variation on what we saw in other, in other laws from that period. Okay. It's not the same, but it's, it's not unrelated. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so something is, 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 is to be introduced to, uh, uh, to solve the, the, the solution. Number three, the solution must make some sense in the context of society at that time. Then I heard or maybe I'm assuming number four is that the solution or the lesson must be simple, clear, and and unambiguous. In other words, you can't prattle around with it or else the message won't necessarily come across. And and therefore, sort of number five then is, however, uh, today, that lesson or solution can be made to be a little bit more nuanced. In hindsight, uh, we can create circumstances or situations 
that maybe negate or countermand or bring into question the accuracy of what really happened uh, in order to uh, mitigate what's going on. But at the time, uh, what was needed was uh, a solution that, that uh, fixed the wrong, uh, that made sense to them, uh, that was clear and, ambiguous and unambiguous, uh, and, and, um, and basically uh, put, the, put the thing to bed. Um, um, but now life can be a little bit more nuanced and complicated. That's sort of what I took away from that. What's your reaction um, to that? So I definitely agree with the first three. Um, I'm not sure if it's about unambiguous because remember we're reading, we're reading a sentence in a law code. I don't know historically uh, that judges back then were unable to hear complexity and say certain cases are not exactly the same and maybe we'll handle things differently. I doubt that they were robot, they robotically, you know, uh, followed the laws as is. I think my point is, is that the principles they were working with were to, to right the wrongs in the society they lived in. Uh, and it's not the society we live in. And, they're, and therefore, to, to implement what they're trying to do would actually hurt. Meaning, if we decided, oh, no, that's the law, let's, let's have them, you know, uh, marry, the, marry the rapist, that would be horrifying. Also, we'd say, oh, well, this law only applies to, uh, to virgins, and you know, any woman is not a virgin, so then she gets nothing, right? That would to be totally unfair. In our society, women's lives can be crushed by this. But the law, technically, does not deal with that, because in their society, it wasn't the same thing. Um, so uh, my point is that if, if – is that – if the point is to write the to see this act as a wrong, and to write the wrong, the wrongs have to be the wrongs that the that the women actually experience in their societies, in their lives, in their psychological makeup, not wrongs that might have been experienced uh, by a twelve year old girl three thousand years ago and her father, right? So it, it could be very unethical. It's I, it's very similar, I would think, to some extent, when you look at uh, you know trying to apply medical practices. Right, meaning that the most obvious example nowadays, the whole fight about the mitzitzah uh, bepeh, about people who do uh, who suck the wound of a of a circumcision, right? That was based on a medical theory that is that is wrong. So here you have the ultimate. I don't mean I. I mean irony in the worst possible way. You have a practice that was invented for health reasons, and now that we realize it accomplishes the exact opposite, people are doing it because it's in an old book. You you actually specifically undo the very thing the person who invented it wanted to accomplish, right? It, it, it's, it's horrible, right? So I feel like here it's a little less stark because we're not talking about science, but socially speaking, if you were to force a modern girl to do this, um, it would be horrible. And if you were to say, well, that's the only case, and if we're not going to force it, therefore there's no such thing, there's no such thing as a law protecting rape anymore because that was the only one, right? That would be terrible. Right? It would not accomplish what the law wants to accomplish. That's my point. Okay, someone else? Hey everybody, it's Jonathan. Thank you uh, so much for your time today. Um, I guess my question would be sort of a larger piggyback off of what Judy asked. I think it just, it, it's, I guess the question is then, where is, where do you see that line? How do you balance with that line of at what point, like, what was what point is something considered to be like a hope within the Torah, like shotness, for instance, where we just we don't know why it's there, but we need to do it anyway? Or can we then take any Torah prohibition and, and sort of try to contextualize it and then potentially see that maybe it doesn't apply today? So where is that? How do we, I guess, where, where is that line and how do we spot that? Is there a right. so denomination here, or movement you feel does it best? Or, yeah. So I, I can't comment on who does it best because, you know, the truth is, is religion a lot has to do with what feels authentic to a person and, and you, you can't force it. Uh, I think orthodoxy, when it comes to the homosexuality issue, which, by the way, I'm in the middle, I've written about it. I'm in the middle of a book trying to deal with this question. Uh, or, in orthodoxy, the problem is we have to do double duty when it comes to the homosexual issue. I'll explain why. Um, on the issues that I just discussed, whether it's rape or whether it's uh, sl you know, wholesale slaughter or cherub or whether it's killing you know, rebellious children, the rabbis did one part of the work, which is 
on a technical halachic responsa level, I don't have a problem. I don't have to kill the Canaanites. I don't have to kill my kid. I don't have to marry my daughter to a rapist, right? They solved that. What they haven't done is deal with the higher order question of what can I do with this ethically when I want to be honest about what the Torah is and learn from it, right? But at least I don't have to solve any practical problems. When it came to homosexuality, the rabbis did not see, a, uh, did not see the problem, apparently, uh, with having such a law. So they never dealt with it. I mean, they dealt with it. They, they talk about it, but they don't try to do it. Right? Um, so on that level, we have to be working on two, and I think in the Orthodox, we have to work on two fronts. Um, and here, I think we have to be straight honest about what we're doing, even though it's often unpleasant. A lot of people want to imagine that, you know, halakha, like the rabbis did, halakha can just solve itself, and really, really, halakha has no problem with homosexuality. I think the bottom line is we have to do two things at once. Number one, at least some texts in the Torah do have a problem with homosexual sex between men. Um, specifically in obviously Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Um, for those who understand that the Torah is put together by multiple, you know, over time and all that, you could, you could we have a number of pieces on it at Torah.com. It's not, it's not clear that other, other books in the Torah have this problem. And there, I think there was a, a, a question about it. However, it does exist. The problem exists. Um, we have to try to understand what was bothering them it doesn't, and see if there's anything about that that would be relevant to our society. You know, Steve Greenberg uh, deals with this in his, re, you know, Wrestling with God and Man, right? That, uh, that the idea, uh, you know, that it talks about treating, you know, treating a man like a woman. And this, uh, you know, in their sense, treating a man like a woman was degrading him, right? So the act of degrading another person is like degrading God, right? Because every person is Um It happens to be there are some Bible scholars, Richard Elliott Freeman, um, for example, uh, and Shauna Delansky, who, who think that, you know, who independently in their, in their, in their critical scholarship came to a similar conclusion. Um, on the other hand, we also have to deal with it halakhically. We, we, have to, we have to do the rabbi's work too. We have to come up with a technical out. Meaning we have to have both things. For those who are obsessed with the minutia of halacha, we have to have a legal response. And for those who are willing to deal with the ethical level, we have to have a more general response. Right? So I think we have to do double the work because the rabbis didn't do the first half for us this time. Any, any other questions? Or comments? Any of the women want to ask one? was kind of a heavy uh, woman topic, I have to say. If I can ask a follow-up question, I guess the question then would be, who is the we that needs to do the work and who should do it and how should it get done and what do we do to push it forward? I think especially it's, it's a very pressing problem, right? You've got people, I mean, the adolescent suicide rate for people in that category is, is very, very high. It's like 20% versus 3.5% or not. Suicide, suicide attempt rate is about 20%. And it's, yes. so what do we I guess, what do we do to address and who is the we and how, how do we take action forward and be solutions oriented, I guess? I mean, the, the only we I can take action for is myself. And like I said, I, I, I am trying to work on it. I'm sure of Shmuley also and uh, many others, who's, whichever people who could deal with halakha or could deal with ethics and see the problem and live in the Orthodox world have to deal with it. Okay. Um, well, um, I feel like I've got 30 more questions, but we do want to stop on time here. So um, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Rabbi Dr. Zev Farber, for all of your work and for this uh, fascinating presentation, um, which for me only raises more questions than answers, but you've covered so much ground in this time. And uh, friends, we've got so much going on, as you have seen. We hope you'll continue to join our, our August and September programs. Um, our classes and our book talks and the like. So uh, wishing everyone a wonderful day. And um, if you know someone who missed this, we will be putting up the recording soon. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good day. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you very much. Thank you.